John. Are we ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm okay. Sorry. We're all waiting for each other. Okay. okay. Good evening. And, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm John Hine, the uh, chairperson of the 6270 uh, Global Grants Committee. And uh, we very much appreciate your, your learning more about global grants and qualifying to at least begin to participate in this wonderful process. We're going to start out this session with a, a, a quote from the mission of the Rotary Foundation. And for your information, everything that is in quotations in this PowerPoint is actual quotations from Rotary information. Uh, so when you see something in quotations, it, it, that's the source. So the mission of Rotary, of Rotary Foundation is to enable Rotarians to advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through the improvement of health, the support of education, and the alleviation of poverty. And you'll note that the word world is highlighted because Rotary is in fact a world organization. Uh, Jim and I just attended a zone, zone meeting in Minneapolis and, and it's the goal of Rotary to get all Rotary clubs to appreciate that as much as you do for your communities, you, re, you, re, you remember that Rotary is in fact a world organization and we are trying to help you get involved in whatever level you want in global grant projects. So that is kind of the, that is the whole purpose of, of this seminar. Uh, next, Jim, Andy. Yeah, so this is, uh, I'm Jim Cantrell. I'm the uh, District International Service Chair for District 6220. Um, talking to you from uh, Snowy Marquette, Michigan, of the Upper Peninsula. So uh, as an overview of our session, we're gonna talk about what global grants are, what are uh, district designated funds, what a club must do to qualify types of projects. That's our areas of focus, the planning process, what is the process and available resources. And we'll finish up with some lessons learned over some previous grant projects that we've had. The next slide, please, Andy. So to save a bit of time, we are going to be using a bit of acronyms tonight. Many of these will be familiar to you. Uh, district Designated Funds or DDF. When it's GG or DG, those are the grant types, global or district. MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding. NGOs, those are non-government organizations. TRF, Rotary Foundation. Uh, vocational Training Team is VTT. Uh, Rotary International World Fund is WF. And then there's the District Rotary Foundation Chair, DRFC. Some of these we'll be using more often than not. And so that's uh, kind of where we are. So John, you get the next slide. Okay, so let's start with what is this thing called DDF, District Designated Funds? And it's, it's not an actual dollar amount that the clubs have, but it's, a, it's an account kept by Rotary based upon the donations of all of the clubs in every district uh, three years ago. And until about three years ago, Rotary Foundation was unique in its ability to fund its operations with the income from those initial investments. So all Rotary clubs would invest in Rotary International. Rotary International would use those funds for three years. The interest would cover the operations. And at the end of three years, half of it would go to the Rotary Foundation and the other half would theoretically go back to the districts, to the, the districts themselves and be used for district grants and global grants. So that's why it's important for districts to have a good contribution to the Rotary Foundation because that is the penultimate source of the funding that we have for the funding of our projects. Um, Three years ago, they realized that when interest rates began to drop, they didn't cover the operating expenses and the, the, the rules have changed a little bit. Now it's at the end of each three year period, only 45% of the DDF goes back to the districts and 55% goes to the World Foundation. And that 55% is available on a competitive basis to be used by Rotary Foundation for what are called matching funds. And we'll talk about that tonight. When a district 
DDF is contributed to a global grant pro project, then Rotary Foundation contributes an equal amount of DDF for 90% of the DDF for that project. And, and that is the account that they hold this DDF in. So uh, Jim, you wanna go on next? Sure. So there, there are essentially three types of projects that Rotary International funds at the global level. Uh, first and probably the largest share will be humanitarian projects. You have to have a, a project that has a budget minimum of 30K and the World Fund match minimum is going to be 15,000 um, uh, up to a maximum of 200,000. The second type are vocational training teams or VTT. Again, a minimum budget of 30K using DDF and World Funds. And finally, we have uh, some international scholars, which again fund 30K using DDF and World Funds. Now, historically, 6270 uh, has, has funded a VTT and a scholarship in alternate years, depending on available funds. Uh, District 6220 has funded scholarships in four of the last five years, along with uh, global grants for humanitarian projects. So next slide. So this is something that uh, John alluded to earlier. Uh, the, the World uh, Rotary International World Fund shared funds. In 2015, these funds were used to match 100% of district DDF and 50% of club donations. A couple of years ago, that 50% match for club contributions was discontinued. And two years ago, the match for district DDF was reduced to 80%. And that's to be able to cover operating expenses, just given the, the market trends and what have you. And so John's going to talk a little bit about that background on the next slide. The next slide shows the uh, how District 6270 allocates the DDF that it receives from the Rotary no, Foundation. No, no, no. You're skipping a slide here, John, I think. Okay. Got it. Yes. Okay. Where are the funds that continue? Historically, the Rotary Foundation used income from its funds to support its operations, as Jim and I alluded to. Uh, and it was in 2014 that they determined that the investment income was not sufficient to cover operating costs. So they then created the reserve fund uh, for when investment return does not cover operating expenses. And it has been every year since 2014. Now that interest rates are going up, uh, who knows whether we'll get back to having it covered. But this is also funded by 5% of the cash contributions to the Rotary Foundation. Those are the contributions made by individual clubs to a project through the Rotary Foundation. And we'll talk later on about, you have the option as a club to contribute to a project through the sponsoring club sending the money directly to the project. And then you do not have this 5% surcharge uh, but if you put it through the Rotary Foundation, they have a 5% charge to cover the costs. And another big difference though between these two is that if you do not run it through Rotary Foundation, you do not get any Paul Harris credits for the contribution. And to many smaller clubs, those Paul Harris credits are very important. So you've got to decide whether you want the Paul Harris credits. And this is important for clubs that only have three or four or five thousand dollars or even two thousand dollars that they want to contribute to a project. They want to be involved in a project. They don't want to take the responsibility of being a sponsor, uh, but they can be involved as a cash contributor to the project. Um, so then I'm going to take you on to the District 6270. Did you switch the slide? Yeah. I have. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I said, the amount that we receive is based upon the contributions of 6220 clubs, 6270 clubs in 2019 and 2020. The budget for this year, we receive $140,227, roughly. It's again, it's not dollars, but we call them dollars. 
Um, our endowment earnings were 1,073, and then we had unallocated DDF of 22,572. So there were roughly $173,000 of funds available for district grants, global scholars, VTTs, and global grants. District grants historically in our district, I think in most districts, uh, get one half of that amount. I think it cannot exceed that one half, but you're all familiar, I think, with district grants and, and they're very, very beneficial to the various clubs and, and they get one half of that $140,000. I see it's not exactly one half here. So uh, the Global Scholar um, is, a, is a scholarship that we used to give every other year, but because in the last three years, COVID has really has stopped that program and the VTT program, um, our district uh, foundation committee decided that we would fund this year both a Global Scholar and two VTT programs. Now, VTT programs require $15,000 a piece. We decided we would give 20,000 of DDF and we would fund two programs. Uh, one is a, a Guatemala uh, Smiles program and the other is a Belize Hospital Supply Program. Uh, the Global Scholar follows upon the scholarship that we gave last year and I think it was that our district has the first female scholar uh, to have been awarded a scholar. No, that's not true. But no, it's the, it's, the, it's the first international environment, environmental one, I think up here, but I don't know down there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They added environmental to the, the, the areas of focus, and we had the first international scholar in environmental. So that leaves for global grants $61,705. Uh, Jim, you want to take us through what 6220 has for this year? Sure. This is broken up a little bit differently. Um, you know, co coming into this fiscal year, we had uh, north of 110K for carry forward DDF. We had uh, a couple of thousand bucks in uh, endowment. Um, we had a share contribution of 55,000. Um, and we had available for district grants. $167,722. Uh, thus far, we have committed 27750 of DDF. And of course, that was estimated in March. It does not include district project funds remaining. And, uh, uh, and we've now committed to global grants, both scholar and humanitarian, 100000 So our available balance right now on our sheets is just a little bit below 40k that we could still spend in this fiscal year in the next few months. So, how do you qualify for a global grant? For there, there's some things that you have to do. One of the first things is if you're in my district, at least one club Rotarian must attend a global grant management seminar. For 6270, at least two club Rotarians must attend. Uh, a seminar such as this, right? Um, like the one we're offering today. There, you can also do it by going to the Rotary International site and going through their training program. Ours is a little bit more focused to our regional needs and what have you. The key takeaway from this slide is that since DDF match is an integral part of applying for a global grant to get that 80% match, it really is important to be able to get into DDF. And as many of you know, uh, in your various um, clubs and districts that uh, you have to have a per capita member, a contribution to RI to be able to get a district designated fund. So going forward in our district, um, we're gonna have to uh, average per club, $75 per member to qualify for a DDF. And I have the next slide, but before I do that, I would I would commend 6220 for doing that. 6270 has not yet established that policy, and I think it's only fair. Uh, what that really does is it requires clubs that are going to get DDF for global grant projects to have contributed to uh, 
the Rotary Foundation so that the district has DDF from those funds. A club that has no contribution uh, of DDF, I don't think there are any that have no contribution, but there are some clubs that, that have very minimal contributions. And theoretically in 6270, there's no limit on their getting, being able to get $15,000 of DDF for a project. So I commend 6220 for having adopted that policy. Uh, next slide, please. We do have it up. Okay, um, thank you. Now, also, we've been going a little fast here, so we're now about to get into the nuts and bolts. We've talked about the background. If anybody has any questions, please put them in, in the uh, chat section, and uh, we are monitoring them and sending them on. If it's something that's I think we think important to clarify before we go on, we will do that. Otherwise, uh, we will have answers to those questions at the end of the session. So to qualify for a global grant, the club must enter into what's called a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. It is a legal agreement between the club and the district that outlines the foundation's minimum requirements for matching grants. The club president, president elect, review the MOU, sign it and submit it to the district. The host club also has to sign an MOU uh, with similar requirements and any other what Rotary calls cooperating organization must sign an MOU. So those are the, the, the legal requirements that Rotary can rely upon uh, to make sure that the things that they are requiring for the, uh, the implementation of the global grant will be met. And these include significant responsibilities on the sponsoring club. They are really significant. Uh, you've got to appoint a committee to fund, implement, and manage the project. Now, look, that really should be at two committees, one just to do the fundraising, and then implementing and managing the project is another one. You must adhere to specific bank account requirements. That is absolutely critical, as I will tell you, as I will explain in our lessons learned. You must theoretically maintain a, quote, written financial management plan, which includes accounts and records for items purchased, produced, or distributed. And since most of these things are going to be done in foreign countries, they will be done, they will be using the bills of sale and, and the receipts and the items in the, in the languages of the country in which the project is implemented. So I will stress this more and more throughout this seminar. It's very important that you pick a host that is familiar with these requirements and that you can uh, be sure is going to fulfill them so that you are not stuck as sponsoring organization to, uh, to, to do them instead. And also the MOU requires that all grant activities comply with local law. And this is a classic example. Of how can we sitting here in Milwaukee, Appleton, wherever you are, um, be certain that all grant activities comply with local law. We have to delegate that responsibility to the host club and be able to rely on them for, uh, for, for that compliance. Um, next, please. Additional MOU requirements are that you adhere to all Rotary Foundation reporting requirements, that you cooperate in any Rotary Foundation reviews or audits, and that you report to the district any potential or actual misuse or mismanagement of grant funds. And I'll cover that in the lessons learned as well. But again, we here in a Milwaukee Rotary Club, for example, or who is actually uh, another club in our district had a difficulty in, in one of our projects. And what do you do when you learn that they have those difficulties? And what you do is that if, if the sponsoring club gets knowledge of a uh, misuse or mismanagement of funds, that sponsoring club should go to the district chair, should go to Jim or me, uh, and, and alert them to what the problem is, we'll look at it. And if we think it might be a problem, then we'll bring in the foundation chair. And at that point in time, we will decide in the case that we had, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but this is important. Uh, 
we decided we would bring in the district of the club uh, in Haiti that was involved. And finally, they did get the, the word to Rotary International. Uh, so it's a delicate issue of whether you, the sponsoring club goes to Rotary International with that issue or whether you try to go through the district uh, of the host club to go through with it. But those are the kinds of obligations that you are assuming if you want to be a sponsor. Now, we'll also talk uh, throughout this seminar that there are other ways to, to participate in global grant projects, and that is by contributing to a project that you, that you like and, and leaving those sponsor responsibilities to somebody who has that background. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, what can we use these global grants for? Well, here we turn to the current seven areas of focus for the Rotary Foundation. Um, and most of you are familiar with this. You can find it on the Rotary websites, uh, peace and conflict prevention, management, uh, disease prevention, treatment, water sanitation, maternal and child health, basic education literacy, economic and community development. And uh, the last one that was most recently added was supporting the environment. Uh, now, the, the descriptions and guidelines for each area of focus with sample applications are posted on the Rotary Foundation website, as we're all familiar, rotary.org. Now, even though it's fairly fluid between some of these areas of focus. Uh, any, given that, any global grant could and typically does stand more than a single area. But any application that you submit must revolve around a single area of focus and that that must be um, the lion's share of what funding goes to. So for example, if let's say you're doing a, a water sanitation project um, and that's where the money is going to build infrastructure or what have you uh, that's obviously going to affect maternal and child health that's going to affect sustainability and what have you but the grants applications that you put forth you identify a single area of focus so that's how do we me. play go take it away john okay Okay, now let's let's assume that you're a club uh, of, of sufficient substance that you do want to take on the responsibilities of being a sponsor, and there are, are great benefits from being a sponsor as well. I mean, most of these uh, projects have relationships between the host club and the sponsoring club, and they really uh, nurture those relationships. Um, my mantra is that if you want to sponsor a project, and you've got an idea for what the project is, and Jim will get into one of these in our last uh, slide. Uh, I won't steal his thunder, but locate a host club in the country in which the project will be implemented and confirm that that host club has got the capability and the experience to be able to perform the requirements. And one way to determine that is that Every global grant project has to start with what they call a community needs assessment. And Rotary is unlike a lot of other organizations where it truly is grassroots bottom up. That they want all of their projects to start uh, in the country uh, with the local Rotary clubs uh, doing what they call a community needs assessment. And we'll get into that later. And uh, then, building on from there uh, the implementation of what the community has found that it needs. Uh, project planning also requires that you identify a committee and Rotary International now uh, requires that every sponsor have at least three people on this committee. Um, I recommend that, that one person be responsible for raising the funds, the other person be responsible for global grant applications, and the other be responsible for implementations and providing pro public re, uh, PR, public relations. That might even be a fourth person because that's becoming even more and more significant 
uh, an element in global grants and a really an important element, especially if you're going to uh, encourage other clubs to participate. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> also in project planning, identify who will design and implement the project. Uh, for the Guatemala projects that District 6270 is involved in, we have the benefit of working with Engineers Without Borders. And Engineers Without Borders provides two unique perspectives to, to what we do. They have an off, a, a chapter in Guatemala. They know the clubs in Guatemala. They know how to work with the local, local dis, di, communities in Guatemala to do the community needs assessment. They also have student chapters in Milwaukee, three of them. And the student chapters can help with the design of the project, a water project or a bridge project. And the student chapters can even uh, during their, their breaks go down and implement the project. So uh, decide, identify who's gonna design and implement the project. And a resource for this is what's called the rot Rotary Cadre. Those are a group of of professionals who have agreed to, hold, uh, to be available to you uh, in trying to design a project and identifying people with the expertise that you need, uh, not only speaking the language, but, but being able to implement the project. And if you have an interest in um, learning more about the cadre, send me an email and, and I will put you in touch if you're in 6220, 70. And uh, Jim, I'm certain we'll do the same if you're in 6220. Um, then finally, if you, once you've got that all background in 6270, and I think 6220 as well, we have developed a preliminary project information form. And I'll go through that in detail later on. And you send that to the district to the district international service chair. You send it to me for 6270, to Jim for 6220. And you can log on to Rotary Grant Center and begin the application process in order to get a global grant number. So the, after you do all of that background that I've just discussed, you actually start the process by going to Rotary International and clicking on to start an application and get the grant number because that becomes the way to identify a grant from its inception through the final completion. Uh, next slide, please. It is most important step for a club that wants a sponsor is, as I said, the host club. It is the host club that conducts the community needs assessment in, in Guatemala, what we do is we identify the community, and often these are communities of maybe 150 to 200 families, uh, but a, a representative of Engineers Without Borders and Vista Hermosa go to that community and do the community needs assessment. It is the host club that controls the funds. The funds that go to the project don't come through the sponsoring club. They go directly to the individual segregated bank account in the host club. It is the host club that assures compliance with the Rotary International bid requirements. They require three bids for uh, items that are purchased as a part of the grant. And they've got to keep the paperwork for that um, and be able to include that paperwork in the final report. It is the host club that maintains required record keeping and it is the host club, as I've said earlier, that assures compliance with local law. And then most important of all, or out there all important, is that the host club has primary responsibility for rotary reporting. There's interim reporting and there's a final report and it's the host club that must do that. And in one of the lessons learned, I'll explain the problems that you have when the host club falls down in that responsibility. If the host club cannot do any of these, the sponsoring club must. So next slide, please. Okay, now let's get into this concept of the community assessment. <laughs> uh, tips, there is a Rotary International uh, website that you can go to and get this document called Tips for Community Assessment. And it tells you everything you need to know or what the host club needs to know to conduct the assessment, 
to host community meetings, to design a good survey. This is not a, a, a topographical survey, it's a survey of, of the community and the kinds of questions that'll bring about the answers that you want. Uh, they recommend that you interview community members and they'll give you help in designing and conducting those interviews and then also doing a uh, focus group. So you can get that community assessment tool by go going on to rotary.org and then clicking on foundation and then clicking on rotary grants and all of the information that you could possibly want to be able to do a global grant. You can get that information there. At the end of this uh, seminar, we'll, we'll give you another uh, slide on the uh, websites that you can uh, go to to get this information. Uh, next slide, please. John, there's a quick question. Go Does ahead. Global grants have to be used in a foreign country. Global, there, there can be, well, no, they have to be used in a country different from the, the sponsoring company. Uh, well, I mean, that's not true. No, they well, do not. They Jim, let go me, ahead. Me, you, you're doing yeah. the reverse grant. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let me step in. We'll give you an example of this later on. You can do something that is called a reverse gl global grant. And that's where uh, a club from another country serves as the sponsor. And you have a host club who is uh, here in the United States. And so it's essentially the same process, but it kind of flips around. Uh, those are relatively rare, as you might imagine, the, the greatest need is not in the United States, but we do have um, some examples of that that we can talk about, but they are they're rare, precious, and beautiful, as we'll talk about later on. Any other questions? No, that was it. Okay, uh, now are we on the slide uh, project committee? Yes. Okay. And this again is a quotation from Rotary International. The host and international sponsors each have a project committee of at least three Rotary members. Having a project committee ensures that you have team support for your project. You know all the details of the project, you make decisions together, and you make sure you're meeting your goals and following your budget. That has developed because 10 years ago, when I first started getting involved in this, too often it appeared to me that the sponsor for a global grant was a, a club with sufficient resources, but with one person uh, who had just traveled to Ghana or to India or Guatemala or Ecuador and uh, came back with this great idea and, and let's do it. But then the rest of the club said, go ahead. Uh, you can do it, but he did, didn't. That person did not have this uh, three-person or four-person committee, and sometimes that got into trouble when that person was uh, was strained too far. So Rotary International really wants it to be a group uh, project at both the sponsor level and the host level, and I think it's a good idea. So uh, next slide, please. Additional project planning is of course, develop a realistic budget for the project. And the budget should provide, must provide for monitoring and evaluation. This is an addition in the last two years, I would say. Uh, they want, Rotary International wants sustainable projects. They wanna know it's gonna last more than three or four years. So in a water project, you wanna make sure that it, there's a, a way to pay for the water and that there's a way to maintain the process. Uh, and the evaluation process starts at the very beginning. You look at what the quality of the water was uh, before you opened the spigot, and then you looked at it one year and two years later, and you built that into your plan. You've got to provide for contingencies, um, and the most recent contingency that is really becoming problematic is inflation. Um, <clears throat> we are finding that the bids are, of course, coming in sometimes 8, 10, 20, even 25% higher than what you originally uh, had thought when you were starting dreaming about the project. And there's a, a little wrinkle here because I learned recently that Rotary International does not want to have a contingency of, of more than 7%. Well, inflation is higher than 7% right now, so I don't know how that's gonna wash out, 
but that's something to use the cadre for to figure out. And we're in Milwaukee doing a project right now where we're talking about that. How, how are we going to handle that inflation contingency? Um, I said earlier that the way to start this project, and this is my personal opinion, I think there are other people who don't necessarily agree with me, but I think you, the place to start is to go and start an application and get the grant number. Uh, you then have one year to complete that application and you can change it as often as you want uh, up until the time that you make the final submission. So my recommendation is you get the grant number, we get it all into the system, you put together your preliminary numbers and then you can massage them as much as you want, uh, but be careful, and this is gonna be in my lessons learned that uh, once you sign off on it, you can make no changes after that. Uh, another additional project plan is confirm the financial management plan. I think what Rotary International is looking for in the financial management plan is just an assurance at the host club level that there is record keeping, that there is periodic reporting um, from the people who are implementing the project to the host club, the ones who are going to have to put together the accounting so that it's not at the end of three months you try to Put everything together at the end, but that there is a process. I have yet to see a written definition of what a financial management plan is, but that's, in my judgment, what Rotary International is requiring. Develop a project management timeline. Uh, as any good construction project would be, you, you want to at least at the beginning have a good timeline and you want to see how you're adhering to it. Uh, in, in Latin America, we call it TICO time. Uh, they tend to be a little bit slower in following through. And, and we have now developed in Milwaukee uh, weekly project meetings to, uh, to keep things on track. And they're a wonderful experience because you can, you can really get, you feel that you're involved in the project by participating in those weekly project meetings. And then also confirm a document retention plan. Rotary International requires that you have a document retention plan by which all documents, including all receipts and all correspondence involving the project be maintained for a minimum of seven years. That again is to be maintained by the host company country. Um, in my mind, there's little sense in having the, the sponsoring uh, club be responsible for that because it's in Guatemala, it's in Spanish. And I, there are members of our club, I'm sure, who can read Spanish, but what sense does it make to have us uh, maintain all those documents for seven years when nobody in Milwaukee can really understand them? So, uh, but it's something the host club should be doing. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so then decide who will get what who will do what and assign the key tasks. Uh, I think among the key tasks are volunteer coordination, who's gonna do your fundraising, who's gonna do your uh, implementation, uh, assign key tasks to the monitoring and evaluation so that that is not forgotten about, assign key people who will do the reporting to Rotary International. Uh, we're fortunate in Guatemala, they have the Vista Hermosa Club uh, they always have 10 going active global grants, so they know how to do the reporting. And then a new element that we've added in, in 62, 20, 70 in this last uh, three years is community outreach, because we've become more interested in getting other clubs to join as contributing clubs. And we've established now, and there's a policy in our district that you have at least two reports to your contributing clubs. And a PR person is, I think, necessary, not, I think it's necessary for that kind of, of reporting to, to your really constituents, the other clubs who have invested in your project. Um, Rotary tells us that by assigning responsibilities at the beginning, you can save time later, ensure jobs are done, and let your project committee focus on the overall outcome of your grant funded project. So that's the reason that you want to assign tasks at the beginning. Uh, Jim, I think you're next. Yeah, I wanna talk a bit about monitoring and evaluation. Uh, for any of you who have who've ever participated in the, the grant making 
uh, process, especially at the, the federal or the state level. Uh, monitoring and evaluation really came to the fore about 15 years ago because it's not one and done. It's not just throwing a bunch of money at it and hoping for the best. We wanna be able to assess and be able to learn from our mistakes so that we can do better projects in the future. To that end, um, Rotary International a few years ago started saying that global grant sponsors for humanitarian projects must incorporate a monitoring evaluation plan in the areas of focus section of the ongoing grant application. And so that's it. it. It may seem daunting sometimes, but it really is. If you take it in small steps, it's not that bad. You establish some clear project goals and you'll identify those in the application. Uh, you'll identify applicable Rotary Foundation standard measures, which are available on the Rotary International site. And then you will um, identify additional project specific measures. Now, what, what we suggest is that you add only measures that clearly link to specific goals and, and will demonstrate the project's impact on participants' lives, knowledge, or health. And it's tied to that area of focus. Again, the one thing that everything kind of molds around. And so um, the fourth is that, you know, you establish some baseline data and the methods you use to collect data. So John mentioned earlier on, when we do uh, water and sanitation projects, uh, and let's say you're trying to deliver water to a, a community. You wanna find out what is the quality of the water there now and what's going to be the quality of the water in the future as the plan goes forward. That plan gets submitted as part of the online application and that we collect data during the project and monitor progress. Now, when you collect the data, you, you wanna avoid this issue of double counting. Data is going to count for a specific goal a specific reason, and it's not going to double up with something else. And we evaluate data and, and submit the results in the online report, modify the documentation to include actual results. Now that's all, that's all verbiage that comes from Rotary International. One thing that's important that at least I've seen when I've been reviewing some preliminary project uh, proposals is that uh, a sponsoring or uh, sponsoring club will sit back and say, well, this is going to benefit everybody in the community when in fact it may not. It could, and it certainly could as the exa hypothetical example I gave earlier that it might uh, produce community sustainability. But that if that's not the focus of your, of your project, you need to stick to just who is going to benefit directly from that project. So it's the number of water spigots that are, that are delivering um, nourishing water to homes. It's the number of kids that are getting literacy training or what have you. So the next slide is gonna talk about uh, financial management and I'm gonna kick it back to John. And before I go on to financial management, I'll give an example of, of sometimes the difficulty of identifying the people benefiting from the project. The Esquindla Hospital <coughs> project uh, delivered water to a, a regional hospital that uh, had insufficient water to, to operate for uh, beyond noon. It, people who came to the hospital after noon had to bring their own water. But how do you then determine who's gonna benefit from that project? And, and that was something we really had to work on because it's, it's a regional hospital, it's all the people in the region, but you can't say the region's got 80,000 people and they're all gonna benefit and you have to figure out what it is that you're going to do. Another example of this is the, the water projects in a, in a Guatemalan uh, mountain community where there may be 200 households, which may be uh, 600 people. And interestingly enough, they do a lot of the work. They dig the trenches and they, uh, uh, provide uh, for the, the building of the holding tanks and they require that every house that is going to get a connection participate in that work. And if you're disabled or something like that, you can delegate it to somebody else, but they, that's how you get full community support 
and you can tell the number of people uh, who are going to benefit because it's the number of people who live in the houses that have actual connections to their house from the holding tank uh, for the water. So uh, it's a little background information. Okay, I'll, I'll get on to the uh, financial management plan, which I've spoken of a little bit. The key thing here is you must have a separate bank account for each and every project no commingling of funds. And I will explain in our lessons learned why that's important. Uh, it, it's also required at the, whole, at the sponsoring club that the money that you collect in fundraising be in a separate bank account if you're going to actually collect that money and send it on elsewhere. Um, the accounting must track all income and expenses and, and uh, all the way down to the $5 expenses. So the, the paper trail is very, very important. So keep all invoices, receipts, checks, credit card statements, and make copies of them because on many of these, um, they're on paper and, and it fades very quickly. Again, this is a host uh, club responsibility and just make sure that your host club has the capability of performing this. Um, Jim, I think you're next. Right, so I'm gonna give you an example of a current project that we're working on. And pretty soon we're on the cusp of finishing it up, finishing it up by the end of the year, or very early 2023. Uh, this is a small community of 50 homes that um, they didn't have any potable water uh, in, in the community. They relied upon rainwater in the, uh, in the off season, in the non rainy season. Uh, they'd have to travel 45 minutes to be able to get water that was fairly polluted. And so it produced a lot of the disease and infirmity within the community. And so um, we, with one of our partners, uh, EWB USA Guatemala, and that's Engineers Without Borders, uh, uh, worked with the, the city of El Tesoro in Guatemala to identify where a spring was and how we could get water into these households. And we developed a, a modest budget um, and uh, I worked uh, with 6270 and I really want to put a shout out to uh, John and, and Jerry and the others in 6270 who really helped, helped us work through this because they had a lot of the in-country boots on the ground resources we needed. So we contributed between our, our two uh, districts, 20K, the World Fund gave an 80% match of that. We were able to go out and get uh, a little over $3,000 from various clubs to contribute to this relatively modest project. And we were fortunate enough in the past three years or so to have an anonymous donor from uh, Central America. And what she had committed to doing was to uh, helping match both DDF and to a certain level uh, club contributions. And so that was another almost $21,000. That got us to a $60,000 figure. Now there's an asterisk on this slide that if clubs uh, funnel their money through the Rotary Foundation, which is a useful way to do it. And as John noted, that gives you opportunities to leverage that for all sorts of, of further glory for a club. You're going to have to have a 5% administrative fee. The alternative is to send it directly to the host club who's going to be keeping the financial records. Now, in this case, we've been working with uh, Vista Hermosa, which has just a great track record down in Guatemala. Um, of course, there's EWB, there's the city of El Tesoro, and there was a local hospital that also provided some of the training for this. Um, we've been moving along. We've had a couple of hiccups in terms of supply chain and weather conditions, but uh, it's we are we're just about there. Uh, as John mentioned, every week we uh, are talking with people in Guatemala and here in Wisconsin and Michigan um, about uh, progress that we're making. We've just got a great team together, and that we are we are about seventy percent. In the final stages of, of putting taps into the homes and having water go in, we've been filling up a, 
a, a collection tank. We've got all our lines run and we are, we're doing, we're, we're just going great guns. And we're going to be closing this out soon and doing some real good for the world. So that was a great project um, that we have now along with some others. Now, John's going to spend some time briefly going through a, a set of slides that is what's dealing with a global grant preliminary project information form. I don't think he's going to read through the whole thing, but it's a, very, it's a relatively simple form, but it, it is to the benefit of clubs that once they apply for a grant and get that number to fill this out and send it to the, the, their, their district, that would be me or John, and we can work with our committees to say, does this you know, pass the sniff test before you go through the more extensive process of actually drafting the grant? So you can take that away, John. Okay, uh, but before I do, go back to the uh, El Tesoro uh, slide because I, it, it demonstrates, I think, two very interesting things. Well, three interesting things. You'll note that the amount is $60,000. Uh, and to me, that is really the, the ideal size of a, a global grant project, the forty-five dollars to $60,000, uh, $70,000 range. Um, you'll note that there was $3,152 in clubs and $20,875 from this anonymous donor. Unfortunately, the anonymous donor will not be around. My understanding is he came up he or she came into the picture when Rotary uh, discontinued the 50% match and reduced <clears throat> the 100% to 80%. So the theory was that this donor would make up those matches uh, on global grant projects. I'm familiar with their, they're doing it in Guatemala. I don't know if they're doing it elsewhere, but I think that I think that, that fund is about to run out. And what that means is we need, and I hope the takeaway from this seminar will be, um, I don't want our club or our club doesn't want to take on the responsibility of sponsoring a global grant project, but we def definitely want to get involved in some kind of international project. And we are, we, we'd like to contribute and we'd like to and we'd like to be part of we'd like to receive those reports that you're talking about um and and we have one or two or three thousand dollars that we can contribute if you can get 10 clubs to contribute two thousand dollars you've made up that anonymous donor so to me that's the future of global grants in 6270 um i would think it's also pretty much true in 6220 so now I'll go on with the boring part. We can go on to the, uh, the preliminary project information form. We used to call this uh, a pre preliminary project information sheet and wanted people to do it in one sheet. But as you'll see, it's more than that. But it's there to, to make sure that a person who is embarking in one of these projects or a club that's embarking on one of these projects understands uh, what it is, what it's doing. And we really, uh, 6270 uh, takes the position that we're kind of the gatekeepers. Uh, not only do we assure that the project is within one of the areas of focus, but is it the kind of project that, that, that would succeed if they're able to follow through on it? We're not going to look at the engineering details. Uh, we're not going to really look hard at the fundraising. Is it capable, uh, capable of, of getting it? Um, but we'll, we'll let Rotary International deal with the project planning, but we do want to know that, first of all, um, as we say, and we'll start going through this now, identify the two members of your club who have uh, attended one of these seminars or the Rotary International Global Grant Management Seminar. Frankly, I think this one is more interesting, but I've got a bit of a bias for that. Um, it John, then has... <laughs> you agree, John? Jim? John, we have a question. Sure. Do contributing clubs need to have members attend global grant training or just write a check? No, they can just they can just write a check. Well, but it's, it, it, if you're planning on applying for DDF and the global grant, then you have to go through the training. But we have a number that just and it's not just clubs; it's individuals, it's corporations. 
that's where we're going to make things up. Okay. It's, it's, and it's not just write a check. That's, I'm really pushing on that. It's become a participant, uh, get the newsletters, uh, send the newsletters to the other members of your club and uh, get and participate as you want. And I think maybe attend one of these so you can see what a global grant uh, does. But no, you do not have to have a member of your club uh, attend one of these seminars in order to contribute. You are, you are very welcome to become a contributing partner. John, there's a follow-up question. Yep. Can we have a joint club sponsorship? The two clubs get together become a sponsor. I have never heard of that. Um, and again, what I'd want to know if somebody proposed that, I would want to know who's the host. Right. It's the host, and you have to have a single sponsor club, but people can get together. There has to be, you know, people on point with this. So, because in addition, uh, point number three, that it's got to begin with the community needs assessment. And this means you've got a host club who knows how to do that. And it has to be performed uh, within the past year. And with COVID, we ran into some difficulty with that because that really shut everything down and you had to go back. They didn't require that you have, uh, you, you do all of the things for community needs assessment, but they wanted it to be current, uh, which I, you couldn't blame them for that. I mean, that, that, that's what you wanted to have. Uh, obviously, which area of focus, and as Jim said, choose only one. Most projects can arguably be, be two or three or four, but for Rotary's focus, they want you to focus on the one uh, most important area of focus that your, your project will meet. Um, name the host club and the Rotary district in which that club uh, exists and its proximity to the location of the project and its financial contribution to the project. And next slide, I think I, I go on to say, what is its experience? No. And you also want to know what is the host club's experience with global grants. Uh, and for Vista Hermosa, you can only have 10 global grants at a time. And uh, we're now with a project that we're ready to go forward with and we're waiting for one of Vista Hobos's uh, projects to uh, get completed and get accepted so that it can take us on as their 10th person, so uh, 10th project. So those are the kinds of things you need to know about your, your host club. Okay, now we can go on to the next slide, which is number six. Oh, that's, that is what I'm thinking. Identify any cooperating organization to be engaged in the project. And, here, Jim and I have both referred to Engineers Without Borders. That's an NGO, and uh, they have to sign the MOU. Um, uh, Smiles Without uh, the, the uh, uh, Medical Teams uh, is an NGO. NGOs are important uh, players in this uh, global grant process because they know how to, how to work with the communities to do the community assessment, and they know how to, to uh, implement and do the testing. So they are a good resource for the actual planning and implementation of the project. Uh, identify all Rotary clubs and districts that support your project and their financial contributions. That, uh, at this preliminary stage, we accept in 6270, uh, just an, a, a recognition that we're going to have to raise $15,000 from local clubs in order to be able to put this together. And we need, the district wants to know, have you got a realistic fundraising plan uh, to be able to do that? And we've been known to approve a, uh, a request for DDF uh, contingent upon raising those funds in six months. And um, it really doesn't cause any problem because you've got a year to fulfill your application anyway, but you've just got to know that, that they, they have a realistic basis for thinking that they're going to be able to get the contributions to make it work. Uh, what is the anticipated cost of the project? And provide a preliminary budget. Uh, this is a new requirement. A preliminary budget is required in the application. Why not get at least a preliminary, preliminary budget um, 
at the very beginning. Another example is when we go to do a community needs assessment in Guatemala, the, for, the most important thing that we can tell them is, is this going to be a $50,000 project or a $500,000 project? Um, they'll find a community that wants a $500,000 project. We're not going to be able to do that. Uh, a $50,000 project is, is, is perfect. Um, a $200,000 project is a stretch, but you can, you can do that. Have some sense of what your budget is going to be. Uh, next slide, please. As we said earlier, <clears throat> we want in our preliminary information sheet a brief description of <clears throat> the monitoring and evaluation process and make sure that that is already included in the budget. Uh, that means you've got to have somebody in the country, a member of the host club or an NGO that is going to do that evaluation uh, and the monitoring. And uh, just to, so it's not an afterthought that at the end you, you, you slap onto it. it it's a, a part of the initial planning process. Uh, 11, describe the project sustainability plan, uh, including any activities that ensure the project's impact in the future. Uh, we had one project in our district that was going to be out of Nicaragua, and it was a very feasible project. The water project again found the spring, but uh, the again, I think this was Engineers Without Borders in Nicaragua concluded that the community could not afford uh, the minimal cost of uh, paying for the uh, maintenance of the system. So at that point in time, we said it just really not worthwhile pursuing this. Why wait a year and a half to, to learn that reality? Let's move on and find a project that is in fact sustainable. Uh, how much DDF is being requested? 6270 has a requirement that it not be uh, more than 15, uh, 30, one third of the total project cost. This is based upon a $45,000 project. So you could get 15,000 DDF for a $45,000 project or $15,000 max. So on the projects over $45,000, there's again more uh, need to involve other clubs in your district or other districts, which we are now moving into. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we want to know at, at at the beginning, how many Rotarians from your club and the host club will be involved? And Rotary International requires that there be three and describe what they will do. And as I said, my recommendation is have one for fundraising, have one for doing the global grant application, and then one for implementing and follow through. But uh, and a fourth, even for the public relations, uh, get people involved at the beginning. Then, next slide, please. Then, this is actually a kind of a, a contract between the sponsoring club and our district. And you acknowledge that the sponsoring club will provide the district with all MOUs which, and legal agreements that are signed by Rotary International. Uh, that the sponsoring, because once we approve the DDF, the district is really through with the project. I maintain files, electronic files of everything that is done beyond that point in time, but I don't see, I don't, I'm not involved in the writing of the application. So we require that <clears throat> the sponsoring club provide us with a digital copy of the application that was approved and the date of the approval that they were, we're requiring now that the district provide the sponsor provide us with digital copies of all reports filed with Rotary International. And I'm rethinking that because as I said earlier, those reports are in Spanish. Uh, the attachments are in Spanish. Um, I get no benefit from them. And, and what is the real purpose of having us uh, maintain those records, except if there were a problem but you can get all those records from Rotary International and Evanston, and I don't really see any reason. And I'm, I'm thinking at one of our next meetings, we may delete that requirement. But the one that we did add this last uh, time we met was the requirement that you prepare at least two newsletters for the project for distribution to 
the district and to all clubs that participated in the project. And the newsletter should be probably an initial one as you're, as you're implementing it. We're, we're off and running. Uh, the ones that we've done for Esquindla are one page uh, with a nice photo. Uh, anybody who wants copies, uh, send me an email. I'd be delighted to send you all six copies uh, of the newsletters. And I think they're a wonderful way for uh, local clubs to be involved. And then finally, who is the contact on the project with email address and phone numbers? Um, next slide. I think that's you, Jim. Yep. So um, it's fairly straightforward. And you know we're doing some redundancy here. The first thing you do is you go to your district website, um, DACDB or otherwise, and go down and download the preliminary project information form. Complete it with the, the detail that's required by the various districts and uh, submit that to either John or myself. Um, in our districts, we have individuals, our global grants committee members are here to help and to guide. Um, and for, on my part, I'm certainly happy and I spend time talking with people on the phone or over Zoom and I'll review drafts and what have you. Um, the, the, the district committees will evaluate and give recommendations and decide whether authorize the use of DDF. Um, it's, as you saw from our earlier budget slides, if you do this earlier in the, in the uh, an annual cycle, there's going to be more money and more leeway as monies dry up and go to local DDF or they go to, uh, you know, to global grants or what have you, it becomes um, fewer dollars are there to spend. So, it takes some advanced planning. Um, my, my suggestion is that it may be up to a year that you spend time getting prepared to actually go in um, to, uh, to spend um, in that preliminary project information form. And sometimes there's some back and forth there when we do our evaluation. Uh, so, John, back to you. Jim, I just pick up on what you just said, and that is uh, the point that I want to make is you could, you can use a district grant to be able to perform a community needs assessment, um, which is the starting point for a global grant. Yeah. So, yeah, as Jim said, uh, this should be a long-term process. If you've got a project. Uh, that, that you think would really be good for a global grant and you've got a host club that uh, you think can be able to do this and you want to try out try it out you can get three thousand dollars from a district grant uh, jeff is online tell me if i'm wrong <laughs> uh, in order to do that community needs assessment um, you'll be competing with other applicants for a district grant but it, it is a permissible district grant so yeah John, this is Jeff. Yes, I confirm that is correct. That is allowed within the TRF guidelines. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I, I put in uh, Jim and John's email in the chat. So if you, people don't want to do that at the, before you end the session today, you can save the chat and you'll see the emails in there. It also will be in the, in the PowerPoints that will be sent to you later. And also, I'm, I'm putting in a correction to a okay. typo that you had there andy and that's a it's jay cantrell not central <laughs> sorry about that okay. that's okay 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 now Oops. which which slide are we on the process uh that's yeah. me what yeah this one here we are John, okay here we are process for global grant application Okay, if the district committee authorizes the use of DDF, it will it will forward the request at least in six, I think in both this, districts to the district governor and the Rotary Foundation district chair. I think that's the first time we've used that acronym, but that person is a very important person in this process because the the DDF really never runs comes through the district budget. The DDF is is a separate account that is maintained by Rotary International 
uh, in Evanston. Uh, they send the district the funds for district grants, but they don't send the district the funds for the global grants for the scholar or the uh, VTT programs. Uh, so the Rotary Foundation district chairs approval of the use of uh, DDF for a given project is very important. Uh, by that point in time, by the time we've authorized the use of DDF, you will have been well on the way on your application for the, for the uh, online application, but it need not be completed at that point in time. We can authorize the DDF before you have actually fully completed your process. Obviously, if it changes significantly, uh, you should come back to Jim or me and, I, and notify us of the change so that, that we can go back to our committee and uh, approve those changes. Uh, I don't think that would be a, a problem with the kind of thing that we're really talking about. Uh, let me go on to the next slide and see what that one is. Uh, yeah, that's going to that's be me. You know, so yeah. let's say you've gotten to a point where uh, you've got DDF allocated and it's been approved at the district level and you have completed the application and hit the submit button to Rotary International. Then we're going to have a regional grants officer who will review it, maybe some other staff. Maybe if there's a match of more than 50,000 asked for, it will likely be reviewed by a cadre of technical advisors. And it, it's it's a back and forth process. These regional grant officers I have found to be are, are very uh, very accommodating. Um, they want they want the money to be spent well, and they want to do good good in the world. So you might have to do some back and forth with your regional grants officer, and they're they're a great resource. Um, and that's the main rotary contact that will help you throughout the life of the grant. Next slide. Okay, so. Who can help you in developing a, uh, a global grant project? Uh, obviously, Rotary clubs, both in and out of our district. Uh, Rotary International has a, a, a web, uh, their website has got uh, programs uh, or information regarding what other Rotary clubs have done. If you've got a project uh, that you, you, you think would be working well in, say, Ecuador, um, and you find somebody who does a similar project in another uh, country, um, feel free to reach out to that club, uh, to that district or that club and, uh, and find out how they've done it. Other community-based organizations. Um, Rotary International welcomes the support of community-based organizations such as Engineers Without Borders. A caution is they don't want that organization to steal their thunder. They don't want that organization to get credit for the project, um, but they definitely uh, appreciate having somebody like Engineers Without Borders. They're helping perform the community needs assessment, helping the implementation and uh, the evaluation of the project. John, uh, I'm going to interject now. Go um, ahead. The, uh, you know, the, the point here is that I think we want to keep RI branding on a project. Oh, from yes. Start to finish. Okay. Um, that's not to say that, you know, another community based organization, you know, be it a, a service organization, maybe Kiwanis or Exchange, or, um, and you're going to talk about NGOs or corporations here, which are very helpful, um, that they can't get some, some glory off of this as well. But, you know, it's our eye is on point here. And, I'm going to stress that one untapped source that we may fill in off of for anonymous donors and what have you will be corporations because they have money to spend and they have a desire, especially if they are a, a multinational organization, to, to do good as well. And many of our club members are partners or employee, employees in these organizations. And so, or in my case, I'm tied to other NGOs and Sometimes you can reach out to them and say, yeah, we could do this too. So in this slide, we identify four uh, sources of information in Rotary, uh, Rotary's website, uh, just by logging on to my Rotary. And the showcase is a showcase of uh, global grants projects. There's an idea exchange for people who have 
incipient ideas uh, and, and want to develop them. Uh, there's the grants uh, uh, application process. You can actually see the grants that, uh, that are being, uh, for which applications are being made. Um, and there's also a district in 6270, a district showcase um, that we're trying to establish uh, to get even more information for projects that are in, in their beginnings phases and looking for uh, local clubs to be uh, contributing to so that you can then, uh, if you're interested in, in using your $2,000 to $5,000 of international funds, uh, you can go to that district uh, showcase and, and, and see what's being offered. It's, it's difficult to find people to, to uh, do that, but I really think it'd be a good idea. Um, one also, thing that we, John, one ahead. thing we haven't put in here that I just remembered I wanted to when we were building up these slides is that various countries and the districts within those countries will get together and do project fairs. Colombia has been doing this for a while. I believe there's one in India. And uh, those get highlighted through uh, uh, my rotary and rotary.org. We, we send out uh, to people in our district that here's going to be this opportunity. And they're multi day affairs that you can zoom in on, where you have groups that are coming forth with project ideas and they're looking for partners and they're looking for rotary support. So I would really encourage folks when those come across your desktop to carve out some time and participate in them. They're free and you get some great ideas. And if you're interested, for example, in, in water projects, uh, go to rotary.com uh, and, and look at the WASH uh, uh, opportunities and, and join the WASH. I've forgotten what they call themselves there. Uh, Jim, can you help me out? But, well, you know, there's there are these... Uh, there are these kind of like area focus themes or interest areas. Uh, the Rotary website has a lot of these that you can find. That some of them are tied to the environment. Some of them are tied to very specific, narrow issues, just like we do with polio. Okay. Jim, is that you? I <laughs> we've, think we've so. already talked about this pretty much, I think. Okay, so um, there, there and of course, there are some, some resources. We've talked about district websites um, and the Rotary websites that are available to you. Um, and of course, you can always call on John or myself or other people in your clubs that have been associated with global grants over time. But uh, it's a rich resource. I know one of the things we've done up here in 6220 uh, through DACDB is there's actually um, a room that's set up for international grants and a lot of these things are loaded up in already. So, but you can find a number of ways and we can help you navigate that. So we're, we're just about done with this. We want to spend a little bit of time talking about lessons learned. Um, and we're going to briefly go through these. We're going to kind of trade off on some of these. Um, a lot of these are coming out of 6270. Um, the first, I want to talk about a, a reforestation project that my club um, sponsored with an NGO over in Kenya and that we became aware of, um, that uh, there was a group that was in the dry lands of eastern, eastern Kenya. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to put in water cisterns to collect water and um, start planting trees, growing and planting trees. The, uh, uh, this what wasn't that expensive. It was about $30,000 and went a long ways. And they, they ended up, we, we brought a number of clubs together. We got some DDF for this. We did not go through the global grant process. So, um, which the lessons learned here is I probably should have at that time, but we wanted to get this thing up and running. And uh, they're now, it, it, even through COVID, they've been able to plant upwards of, of 30,000 trees per year and have the water and the training to be able to sustain crops for uh, wood, for nuts, for berries, for fruit, and for shade 
in a very dry and, and desolate part of Kenya. It's, it's a wonderful area. I was just on the verge of going to visit that when COVID hit, and of course that went south. Um, so the, the lesson learned there is if we'd had more time and, and I thought more about it, we probably could have we could have taken the step of leveraging that to some global grant funding and even done some more good. So John's going to deal with a number of these in Central America here. Okay, the, the Guatemala Bridge Project was my first global grant project uh, when I joined the Global Grant Committee at the Milwaukee Rotary Club. Um, and it was an economic development project that was based primarily on providing a suspension bridge uh, to a community with a river that when I visited Guatemala in 2015 was, you could, you could across it by going, hopping on stones, but even in, in the dry season, it was still a river, but during the, the rainy season, it was a torrent. And that village was pretty much uh, isolated for uh, four months, five months out of the year during the rainy season. So the idea was to uh, build this suspension bridge and it came out on a highway that would take them then to their nearest community. Um, we were fortunate to uh, use Vista Hermosa is the club in Guatemala. And a little background on Vista Hermosa. The global grant project started, I wanna say maybe around 10 years ago. And it was a pilot project by Rotary International. And they picked three countries in which they would do uh, these what would become global grant projects. And they picked Victor Vista Hermosa as the club in Guatemala that would be involved in the Guatemalan projects. So at that time, Vista Hermosa was already very, very well uh, focused and, and capable of fulfilling all the responsibilities of global grants. I didn't appreciate how important that was at, at this point in time, but uh, it, it, that's why you hear Vista Hermosa so much uh, in terms of Guatemala projects. Uh, the bridge was designed by a EWB chapter, I think maybe it was Marquette MSOE, and it was a long, long suspension bridge over, over the water uh, put together by the students. And uh, I walked across it, it was amazing. But the, when they supplied the, finished the application and submitted it to uh, Rotary International, the question came back, well, where's the economic development? And we said, well, the economic development is being, being able to get to your community uh, the other five months of the year when you're cut off. And they said, and also schools, that was a part of it too. The kids could not go to school uh, because there's no school in that area that was uh, cut off by the rains. But even sending kids to school was not sufficient. And what we finally did at Rotary International's recommendation, and to me it really enhanced the project, is we uh, attracted or attached to the project a Guatemalan agronomist, I think that's what you call them, who went to the village and saw all they were growing was maize, was corn, as all other Mayan uh, Guatemalan vi villages do. And it taught them how to plant and harvest other crops that it could then use the suspension bridge to go to the highway to get to the market uh, and be able to develop a little bit of a currency. So that became the economic development component of this bridge project. And I personally think that Rotary International greatly enhanced the value of that project by, by its recommendation. Uh, the second Guatemala project that I want to talk about is a sanitation project um, where we were providing the second leg to a fairly large village, Hoyaba, uh, and they had already gotten one third of their source of their water. And this was providing a second third of the source of their water uh, through a spring a river uh, that they found, a natural spring that went into a holding tank that went into uh, Hoyaba. And there, what Rotary International wanted to add to the project was proof of, high, 
uh, hy hygienic training? Uh, would would the uh, how did how are you going to tell the community the proper way to use this water? And it took us a little bit by surprise, but what we did is we con contracted with a local hospital to put together a basic hygienic training uh, course that the community members went to uh, using uh, placards, uh, diagrams that uh, you'd see probably in a third or a fourth grade school and teach the community basic hygiene, um, which, and I think um, if I recall correctly, it was a Peace Corps volunteer who, who undertook that part of the process. So again, uh, many people criticize uh, Rotary International for their what they think are fly specking of the of the proposals or the applications. Here again, I think they improved uh, the project by putting that hygiene training into the project. Um, the next one I want to talk about is the importance of reporting. This was a medical project uh, and a VTT, so there were two global grants. The one was to supply medical equipment to Kazakhstan, I think is how you pronounce that. And the other was to provide a training team to go over and teach them how to use the equipment. So it made a lot of sense. And it uh, was a really good project. The difficulty was the accounting for a medical supply project is relatively easy. Um, you buy the, the, the equipment either uh, locally or uh, in the United States. Rotary International prefers that you buy it locally, but if you can get it a better product here and pay the taxes and tariffs to get it there, um, once you get it there, oftentimes that's all that you're doing in the Global Grant Project is buying it and uh, distributing it to the hospital. The hospital will take over and will assemble it, and it's a very easy reporting process. Well, a VTT is there the reporting is done by the sponsoring club. And for some reason, I never knew why the sponsoring club could not document what it was doing, uh, what it had done, the expenses for the, the, the group from Wisconsin that went to Kazakhstan, where they stayed, uh, the expenses that they incurred on that. And it, it, it took about a year and a half or two years uh, for them to finally provide that reporting and Rotary International would not close the project until they had that reporting. So it, that to me illustrates the importance of reporting as does the next one that I wanna talk about which is another Guatemala water system. Here, Vista Hermosa was full up with its 10 projects. So we, we Milwaukee Rotary Club uh, identified another Rotary Club uh, in Guatemala to be the host. And the project was again uh, assisted by uh, Engineers Without Borders. It was designed by a student chapter. It was well implemented uh, and everything went through very fine, except that club did not have the experience in doing uh, Rotary International reporting. And after about six months or 10 months of trying to get them to do the reporting, actually members of our club had them send us all of the receipts and all the documentation and the Milwaukee Rotary Club ultimately had to do that reporting. So the lesson there is if the host is unable to do uh, the things that it, it's required to do, that then falls upon the host company, uh, the, the sponsoring club. Uh, and I can assure you the person who wrote the application was not happy trying to figure out how he was going to comply with the reporting requirements. Um, and then the next one even highlights that better. And this was a Haitian project. It was a micro loan project uh, in Haiti. <clears throat> and it was an an outfit, an organization that had experience in, and it was only the women, uh, but it had experience in making these loans and in documenting the loans and um, assuring that they'd be repaid and it had a good reputation. Uh, but the problem there was that for some reason, 
Rotary International let the host club co-mingle the funds for this project with other projects. And I'm, my understanding is that that was because it was difficult to have a small bank account in a Haitian bank. It was the explanation. Uh, I think we're talking about maybe $50,000. Uh, but uh, for some reason, they allowed the host club to co-mingle these funds. And as the funds were distributed, um, it, we, or the host, the sponsoring club who was actively involved in the making of the loans uh, learned that they'd gone through roughly two thirds of the loans uh, and they didn't have the money for the remaining third. And they went to the club and said, where's the money? And the, the club said, well, we haven't received it from Rotary International. Rotary, uh, they went to Rotary International and says, yes, we sent it. And as it turns out, the, the, the bottom line on this is that a member of the host club embezzled the funds and went off to Florida, or yes, went to Florida outside of the jurisdiction. Uh, that was the instance I talked about earlier where <clears throat> we were told that we were, we were concerned that these funds had been misused. My initial understanding was that they had been used for another road project that was not rotary uh, and that the, they were no longer available. And that's where I contacted uh, Mary Beth Sizer, who at that time was foundation chair and said, what do we do? Uh, fortunately, I called our friend in Guatemala and he was the one who suggested we go and make contact with the district uh, in which that Rotary Club was located, which we did. Uh, we didn't go to Rotary International. Uh, we did tell the, uh, the sponsoring club what we were doing and that we were hoping that the district would be able to, uh, at that point, we didn't know it was embezzlement. We just thought it was a uh, misapplication of funds. Uh, I must say Rotary International was very understanding uh, of this because technically, if the, there's a, a misuse of funds or embezzlement in this instance, uh, the club, the sponsoring club could have been responsible for uh, re reimbursing that loss. And that was about $15,000 that, that they were talking about at that point in time. But ultimately Rotary International did get on it and did an audit of the club and in, in that audit, they determined that in fact, the funds had been embezzled. And my understanding is that they made the district of the host pay the $15,000. So uh, there are teeth in, in what we're doing and that's why you really wanna know uh, who your host club is and what their responsibilities are. Uh, and my last one for talking and we're getting along pretty well is Frankly, my favorite project, <clears throat> the Guatemala Escuintla Hospital. This was a regional hospital in Guatemala, not Guatemala City, out in the hinterlands, um, that had a fairly large uh, regional population, uh, but as I said earlier, had a real water problem. They had a well that only provided enough water to last through the morning. They'd bring trucks in uh, to provide, provide additional water. But at the time we got involved, the Rotary International, got our Milwaukee Rotary Club got involved. Um, the people who were going to the hospital had to bring their own water. So uh, a hydraulic study had been done to confirm that there was on site uh, the opportunity to drill a well to be able to uh, pump water into a holding tank that would then pump water into the hospital and provide the needs for the hospital. Uh, it was a $200,000 project. My first experience with a $200,000 project. And Rotary International has different standards for projects in excess of $200,000. In fact, for a $200,000 possible, for any project over $150,000, they will not give you all the money they'll give you half of the money and then have an interim audit uh, to make sure that that is being spent properly. And then when you satisfy that interim audit, they will give you the second half of, of the funding. But 
Um, this was a $200,000 project, which we were able to finance um, through $62,400 of contributions from five districts. Here's where we began District 6270, reaching out to other districts. 6220 uh, was very receptive and, and our first uh, real partner in all of this and and Jim has been a quick learner and is now ready to take off by himself but we also had um, three thousand dollars from district 60 to 420 in Illinois fifteen hundred dollars from the Guatemala and seventeen thousand nine hundred thirteen dollars from a California district uh, that we've been able to make connection with so there was sixty two thousand four hundred dollars from uh, other districts which were matched 80%. And then there were 14 clubs who contributed a total of $24,000 uh, to be able to put this project over the top. So the importance of being able, and the clubs were contributing uh, $2,600, $3,000, $2,381, $2,000, $1,500, $2,100, all those are significant, and all of those clubs then received the newsletter that I was talking about um, to, to, to see how we were coming along on this project. The project had one very interesting technical issue. Uh, as originally designed, the water tower was not tall enough to be able to provide water to the fourth floor and the engineers um, got their pencils out again and figured out how much taller it had to be and, and made that change. Uh, changed the cost a little bit, but it really did not because interestingly enough, this project had an overage, I'll get to that. Um, the height was ultimately sufficient to provide the water. As I indicated, this was the first project that, that we used the, uh, the newsletters. And there are six newsletters that went out. Uh, there was an audit halfway through um, that passed with flying colors. In fact, Rotary International said this was a, a prime example of, of how a project should be designed and implemented. Um, and as was Jim earlier alluded to, Rotary is interested in making sure that they get the credit for uh, the project. And they wanted to make sure that, and it's wonderful that the Rotary International logo uh, is on that water tower. And it can be seen from about a half mile away, I think it's uh, very, very impressive. So um, this was, I think, the most interesting project that we've had. And particularly because it included so many uh, local clubs who are indeed partners uh, to the project. So those are the lessons that we've learned. Jim, I think you were gonna close with uh, some uh, projects on the horizon. Right, um, I'll quickly get through these. Uh, each in their own right, as, uh, in large and small ways, is true to the mission of Rotary International. Uh, the first, and I mentioned this earlier, is a reverse global grant uh, this is spearheaded by Sridhar, our past uh, district governor here in 6220. And it's basically what it does is we've got uh, uh, some clubs in uh, India that are serving as sponsors and the host club will be in the Fox Valley. And <coughs> what they're focusing in on is are identifying uh, early childhood uh, cognitive impairments and setting up a system by which there are uh, navigators to help parents move kids uh, along so that they can compensate for potential problems down the road. Uh, it, was, it was based upon a pilot that was funded. And now the, the, a, a new grant is going to go in and it's going to expand. And so if you've been following at all, the kind of the, the mindset of Rotary over the years, this could eventually go to a what they call projects of scale, which are multi-million dollar projects. Uh, but this won't be that much. Uh, it's going to be, but it'll be a large geographic area. Uh, secondly, there's this one that was uh, uh, spearheaded by some clubs down in the Milwaukee area. 
And uh, they work with an NGO called the Alliance for Smile. That's going to be a vocational training team project. And uh, the idea is to send down a team of uh, specialists to work with kids in Guatemala to repair cleft palate. Uh, and uh, yeah, Alliance for Smiles is, is well receptive. Uh, and it's, it's not a very expensive project. Um, I'm not even certain to the extent it'll, it'll even have to rise to the level of, of a global grant. Uh, the next one is uh, Las Cruces Pachli, again in Guatemala. It's a water system like El Tesoro on steroids. In this case, uh, the conduction line from the spring is, is, is going to go um, 13 kilometers and be distributed to uh, a community of 120 or so families um, with various distribution across different ways. We're designing things for, for uh, or Engineers Without Borders. And I, I, I do want to put a plug in for Engineers Without Borders. Wonderful group. These are college students who work their tails off in designing and, and going down and actually putting boots on the ground and doing work in the country. And they put some of their own fundraising into it. This one, we, we believe we're going to be ready to submit a global grant for this. It's going to be about $200,000 in our meeting today. It looks like we've got that commitment. We're using some of the last of the, of the donor, uh, anonymous donor funds. We have several districts around the country uh, that are contributing to it and many clubs and some are still waiting in the wings. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is still a, 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 a pipe dream of mine. Uh, and it'll take place in Belize, uh, the Punta Gorda. Uh, the Punta Gorda Rotary Club has been working on uh, some, uh, some health grants with the Racine Club down in 6270. And they are uh, uh, working on their hospital, providing all uh, ambulances and equipment and what have you. And that's ongoing now. But this next one, and I'll be down there all well, the end of next week working with the club. Um, there is this uh, nascent growing uh, coffee bean uh, agriculture that's going on outside of and in the hills surrounding Punta Gorda. But right now, what they have to do is take those coffee beans and they have to take them somewhere else for a coffee roasters so they can eventually get them to market. <clears throat> My idea is, and I want to explore this, is that it would be relatively inexpensive to purchase coffee roasters for a cooperative, that those villagers that are dirt poor um, can actually get some added value. So they roast them and then they can get them to a packager and get it to market and you cut out that middleman. In this case, I'm going to try and work with Copal Tree Lodge, um, who is a major economic force there. It's just an economic development grant. Um, and we'll see, we're gonna to have to do the community assessment and what have you. I'll be relying upon our friends down in Punta Gorda. So those are some things that are on the horizon in our minds right now between 6270 and 6220. Um, there may be others. Some of you may have some great ideas. It's it's a good time, you know, as we move into this next year, this next, next fiscal year, to uh, workshop those and see what we can do because we have a lot of contacts in a, a shrinking globe. So now we've got a, a few minutes for questions. If you have any, I want to you know uh, thank people for bearing with John and myself for the past hour fifty minutes or so. So um, we'll answer some questions if. You have them and you can just let me also add, I see that uh, we had 37 people as we started and we've had 37 people. You've all stayed on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to ask a question, if you go to the bottom of your zoom and it, where it says reactions and click on that and raise your hand, you come to the top of the list and we'll uh, then unmute yourself to get asked the questions. Boy, John, I guess we answered all their questions. I don't yes. think it's okay. Well, we got one. Okay. Diane, yeah. unmute yourself, Diane. Sadly, it's not a question, it's a comment. 
<laughs> However, um, I just wanted to tell you that our, the, I'm from Wapaka, and the Wapaka Club's most recent global grant um, was suggested via a Rye student. They can be excellent sources. His host club in Argentina had a possibility to be a host um, for a global grant, and we were the um, uh, the fundraisers and so on and so forth. But it was a water um, drilling operation. The villages didn't have any water at all. Um, they had to go down the mountain to get it. So use your Rotary Youth Exchange students. Um, because we're central states, they're coming from countries that could very well have projects available. We also found my Spanish was not good enough to, to translate some of the stuff that came in. And RI's um, official language is English. So um, RI actually helped with some of the translation when we couldn't figure out what they were doing um, and what they were asking and uh, the people in Argentina, I mean. So RI will translate for you um, and, and let you know well, they'll not only let you know, they'll just send you a copy of the translation and it'll work really well. Um, I would highly recommend sending the money through our eye because we found that we had barely started the project and um, the people in Argentina wanted us to send the pesos or whatever they were. They wanted us to transfer the money immediately. And I'm like, yeah, I think what we want to do is have a third party tracking this. <laughs> uh, I was treasurer at the time. And I would highly recommend going through our eye, not just for the points, but also for the Paul Harris points, but also for the tracking. They were very helpful uh, in that matter also. Thanks. Thank you. Great, Diane, great show, by the way. Someone commented that uh, they benefit from one of their global scholars to do uh, site research and recommended to implement a project in Sierra Leone, another resource for getting projects checked out. We can well, I'll comment go. again and let you know that when I was at the Toronto International Convention, um, that was the first time that I heard about the what you're calling a reverse. Um, it was a global grant that people were doing in the United States. And I'm like, really? Um, the bunch of Canadians were um, working with a club near Four Corners um, so that they could get, I believe it was water cisterns underground on the Navajo reservation, something like that. Um, because they couldn't get any water. And if you put it above ground, it all evaporated or something. I don't remember the exact details, but yes, um, great idea. And thanks for letting us all know about that. Great presentation, by the way. Thank Two you. hours went by fast. Uh, comments come in the chat room or a uh, uh, nice seminar. Uh, a lot of people liked what they heard. And a lot of thank yous, Jim and John. So. Well, thank you for the opportunity, folks. Yeah, um, it's it's dear to my heart, and I think it's dear to John's, and I think it's dear to a lot of us.